Good evening, Christ Temple, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study with Pastor Kenneth Grizzard. We want to remind you that there are three ways that you can continue to support the ministry through your giving. You can come by the sanctuary on Sundays from 11 a.m. until 12 noon and physically give your donations. You can also securely mail your donations to Post Office Box 60310, North Charleston, South Carolina, 29419. In addition, you can give virtually through your PayPal account or through our website, thechristtemplechurch.org, or use the Givelify app. You can download it from your app store to your smartphone, search Christ Temple Church, tap, give, and done. Listen, guys, 2020 has certainly thrown us a curveball of challenges. We must continue to stand strong and trust in God. If there's anything that we as a church can do for you, listed on the screen are several ways that you can contact us. You can reach out to your deacon, elder, or help ministry representative of the month as well. Continue to stay in prayer, Christ Temple because we are indeed stronger together. Now let's join Pastor Kenneth with our Bible study series, Blessed Trinity, already in progress. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Bible study. We are so grateful for your participation. Uh, Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, O God, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to learn of you, Father. We pray that you will just give us ears to hear and hearts that are receptive, Father. We pray that you will download revelation into our spirits so that we can understand and know you better. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we give you praise and thanks. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, We are grateful that the Lord has given us another opportunity to just be able to um, fellowship together, even in this virtual form, uh, to learn of him. And so this month, we've taken a new focus. Um, uh, This month's study is entitled Blessed Trinity. Um, We are going to talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of this Bible study is uh, as we go into the commemoration of uh, Pentecost uh, or the uh, festival of the weeks or grains, um, as we go into um, understanding the birth of the church over 2,000 years ago, how the church, the uh, New Testament church, came out of um, Pentecost, that Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came uh, in such a mighty way. The Bible says that he came uh, with wind and a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire. And so as we commemorate um, the uh, Pentecost, uh, we want to make sure that we understand Um, what it is that uh, we are worshiping, who it is that we are worshiping, um, so that we have a greater awareness. Um, So when we talk about Pentecost, why is Pentecost so important for us to remember? Because it marks um, the day uh, that the New Testament church was started. Uh, The Bible says that um, on that day, Uh, 3,000 souls were saved. Why is that important? Because that shows us um, the um, uh, unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a magnitude that was magnified. Uh, The triune God, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that three, that number three, that perfect union there. Um, And so uh, it shows us that the church was going to uh, explode or multiply in a mighty way. It was the very first sign. And so that is why we uh, remember Pentecost, because it reminds us of how the New Testament church 
was started. It was started with the presence and the power of God. So for us to be successful as the, the church today, we must uh, have a connection uh, on the foundation of how the church was started. Even though we have all of this new technology, um, it is null and void if we don't have um, a true connection to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the power of uh, the Word of God, to the power of the mind of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in operation in our churches. And so this teaching is going to bring us into a place of awareness and understanding. Why is awareness and understanding so important? Because our understanding of God uh, directly affects our experience with him. Um, that is so key. The Bible says to those who are pure, all things are pure. What that tells us is that the position of our mind uh, and the position of our heart will affect uh, the experience that we have with God. And so it's important that uh, we receive understanding. The Bible says, in all thy getting, get understanding. And that is so important because that understanding elevates our experience. Uh, it doesn't mean that God himself changes, but our understanding of him <clears throat> changes and the more we understand about God the greater our experience with him the greater our encounter with him and so tonight we're going to begin to deal with God the Father we're going to talk about who God is and so there's so many things that we could cover so I'm just going to just kind of go over a brief overview um some definitions, some insights about his characteristics and person. Um, there's so much about God. Um, we would never be able to articulate all of it, but we're going to do our best to uh, lay a foundation. So our focus scripture comes from Genesis chapter 1 verse number one um, and it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth why is this our focus scripture because in the beginning God that's key that we understand when I was a young a young man uh, a little boy actually I asked my mother I must have been about six five or six and I said to her I said who is God's mama um, because I was inquisitive. I knew I had a mother. I knew my mother had a mother. I knew my father had a mother. Um, but to understand God, I was trying to figure out where he came from. And my mother said to me, she said, son, God always was and he always will be. I can't explain how I understood, but when she said it, I was just satisfied. I was like, okay, um, so, so when we begin to understand in the beginning God, we have to understand that there was nothing before him. He is, was, and will always be. So everything we've come to know um, has started with his breath, with his words. And so in the beginning God, he created this construct, uh, heaven and earth. He created this, uh, not for him, but for us. He always was. And so we look here that this name, and when we look at it in the, the Hebrew, God here um, represents uh, um, the, the totality of his uh, um, essence as Elohim. Um, this is the foundation of his name, the most frequent Hebrew word for God, uh, occurring over 2,000 times in the Old Testament. Elohim is the earliest name of God in the Old Testament uh, and priest along with other names to this uh, latest period. Jesus is quoted as using a form of the name on the cross. Remember when Jesus um, was about to uh, give up the ghost and he cried out Ella Ella Sabathini uh, that L there is the uh, base of this name Elohim Elohim so um, with the help of the Lord we'll we'll do a study on the importance of understanding um, the names of God because those names of God give us uh, the aspects and attributes of how vast he really is um, so it connects us to that 
So when we talk about um, who God is from this focus scripture, who is God? Um, I think sometimes we as Christians, when we get questions uh, such as this, who is God, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, things of that nature, sometimes um, we try to mystify, um, I guess, so it still feels sanctified in our explanation. But when we do that, um, sometimes we we don't allow the individuals asking those questions to really get understanding. Here's the thing we have to understand when it comes to who God is and how we articulate that. The very first thing we have to understand is that the carnal mind, the unconscious mind, cannot comprehend conscious things. It must be awakened first. And so so for us to fully be able to understand this context, we have to allow ourselves to uh, submit to God, be led by God so that we can understand him. So when we um, begin to understand who is God, we kind of just go to a very basic understanding. So the Westminster um, Shorter Catechism definition uh, is God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, in his wisdom, in his power, in his holiness, in his justice, in his goodness, and in his truth. This description faithfully describes what the Bible consistently declares about God. So let's say it again. Uh, who is God? God is a spirit, first and foremost. He is infinite. He is eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, in his power, in his holiness, in his justice, in his goodness, and in his truth. So this, this description, this definition here gives us a understanding of what the Bible declares about God. So let's just go ahead and begin to start with this. God is a spirit. You might remember if you've been following us the past month or so um, from our last Bible study series when we dealt with worship um, and we began to speak about the spirit. God is a spirit. Um, and so here it is. This word um, means that God is a non-material personal being, self-conscious and self-determining. Um, uh, you see John 4 and 24 says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, God is, uh, he, he, he is, he is a spirit. He is a spirit. Um, so when we deal with this, we have to uh, begin to understand that we, uh, uh, he is infinite. So, so God is infinite. Let's look at this. Uh, the infinite, the infinity of God is not an independent attribute. We uh, must always be specific about this description when we begin to talk about God. Um, infinite in his being. The doctrine is intended to teach that God is everywhere. Psalms 139 and 7 says, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? So as we begin to understand the totality of God as a spirit and being infinite, God is not physically or relatively or measurably big. Um, we cannot box him in. We cannot hold him to um, just a little definition he is so vast the word immensity is to be used here by good theologians but it conveys to some um, minds a false impression as though God were partly here or partly there uh, like a giant like you can only see one portion or an atmosphere is uh, an atmorous mass or a, a fluid um, the omnipresence of God means that what, wherever we are, even if we are like the fugitive Jacob at Bethel, God himself is there. So when we begin to speak about him being infinite, it means that wherever we are, God himself is there. That's what we have to understand about uh, this this one idea, this one understanding that God is infinite, that he is omnipresent, that he is everywhere. 
What that means is no matter where we find ourselves, and this is good news, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter the process, no matter the time, no matter the condition, no matter the situation, wherever we find ourselves, just like Jacob, who was a fugitive, running for his life, running from his brother because of what he did, even though he was running and he was wrong for the things he had done. Uh, the Bible says wherever we are, uh, we got to understand this, it, it alludes to this, that wherever we are, God is there. He is infinite. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So no matter the struggle, no matter the trouble, uh, the Bible says that God is a present help in the time of trouble. That word present, he is there. God is right there with you right now. He is with us right now in the middle of what we are dealing with as a crisis in the world. God is present. He is here. He is infinite. So um, when we begin to talk about him being infinite, he is not just uh, infinite, um, but he is infinite in his wisdom. As we begin to understand the specifics, it helps us to um, relate more to uh, the, the word of the Lord. So in his wisdom, God is infinite in his wisdom. This phrase um, designates God's omniscience. Uh, the Bible throughout regards God's omniscience as all-inclusive. Um, not dependent on a step-by-step -step process of a reasoning. God's knowledge does not increase or diminish. Um, when the temporal events of his redemptive program take place, he eternally knows what he has known in the past and what he will know in the future. In other words, God knows every single thing even before it happens. He's already known it. Amen. That's important that we understand nothing, and I mean nothing, no thing catches God by surprise. That's important that we understand this, okay? Uh, he is also infinite in his power. Uh, these words point to his, um, his, um, onip his omnipotence, his ability to do with power all that power can do. Um, let's say that again. When it says he's infinite in power, these words point to uh, his omnipotence, his ability to do with power all that power can do, uh, his controlling all the power that is or that can be. This is so important. Remember um, in, in the book of uh, Exodus, and when Moses had received the call from the Lord and, and he, he began to say, who shall I say uh, is sending me? You're telling me to go to these people, but they're going to ask me, who's calling me? And he said, tell them that I am that I am. That's a God who was infinite in his power. It means that he can be whatever we need him to be whenever we need him to be it. God is infinite. He has the ability to do with power all that power can do. Lord, have mercy. Uh, Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 says, Now unto him uh, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages world without end amen um, we see here that he is able to do anything and everything exceedingly and abundantly above all we can imagine or think I want you to just take a moment and, and, and think about this your imagination and how how vivid or how how vast it might be god can do more than that god can do more than your imagination my imagination every single person on this earth's imagination he can do exceedingly amen uh, that's powerful amen so we look here uh, god is also infinite he is also infinite in his holiness justice and goodness. 
these words signify God's moral attributes. Holiness is regarded in the Bible as his central ethical character. Uh, be ye holy for I am holy. Basic ethical principles are revealed by the will of God and derive from and based on the character of God. Be holy because I am holy. Everything that surrounds God's commandments are based on this idea to be holy for he is holy. When we begin to talk about holiness, um, in its very, very, very minute form, holiness simply means to be different like God. So he says, be like me. Be like me is what he says. Be like me. Be like God. Um, and that is in ethical principle uh, and characteristic justice. He is infinite in his justice. This refers uh, to his administration of rewards and punishments among those personal beings um, of the universe. Goodness uh, in the context indicates his love, his common grace toward all, and his special grace in the saving of sinners. He is infinite in his Justice. The scripture declares that God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. He gets infinite in that. Uh, he holds all sovereignty in his hand. He is infinite in his truth. Uh, this is one I really want us to pay attention to here. Um, this is an attribute that designates uh, the basis of all logic and rationality. The axis of logic and mathematics and all the laws of reason are not laws apart from God to which God must be subject. They are attributes of his own character. So look at that reasoning and logic. These are attributes of his character. They cannot box him in. They are simply attributes of his own character. When the Bible says that it is impossible for God to lie, uh, it is not contradicting his omnipotence because he has power to do all things. Uh, truth is not an object of power. This is what we have to understand. Truth is not to be uh, truth is not altered by uh, uh, manipulation truth is not altered in any form truth is truth whether it is believed whether it is uh, covered up, whether it is hidden, truth remains truth. No matter what happens, truth remains truth. So in essence, when we talk about uh, God is infinite in his truth, the truth of God truth of God is immutable uh, character is that the Bible says he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2 and 13 says he cannot deny himself. His truth is infinite. When he speaks a thing, when he declares a thing, because he is God, because he is Elohim, because he is the creator of everything, when he speaks, it is, period. It is. So he is infinite in his truth. So let's talk about it. Who is God? God is eternal. God is eternal. I'm going to talk about something right here in just a second. So eternal. This means without temporal beginning or ending. God is he was and he will be. There is no ending. There is no beginning. God is. God existed eternally before the creation uh, of the finite universe. Uh, does not imply a personal subject with no object. For God is triune. Uh, Revelations 1 and 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which which was and which is to come, uh, the Almighty. Uh, we have to understand one thing about eternity. Uh, eternity, time is set down within eternity.
eternity. Eternity is before, eternity is during, eternity is after, but time is a segment. It is a construct of God's design. And so it is that we have to understand that God works uh, in time, on time, before time, and after time. He is omnipresent. He is before he is during, he is after. He is positioned in every single scene and act of life. God is eternal. He is present. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He cannot. He is present. He is everywhere all of the time. Amen. Amen. So, so here it is. God is unchangeable. This is so wonderful to understand. Uh, when we talk about he is unchangeable, this term points to the perfect self-consistency of God's character throughout all eternity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's the reason why we can say if he did it before, he will do it again because he is unchanging. God is faithful. Whatever he spoke, it will come to pass. Malachi 3 and 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Uh, therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. The Lord our God changeth not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That is is good news. God is known. We talk about who is God. God is known by his acts. Supremely, God has spoken to us by his son. Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Further, his invisible being, that is his eternal power and divine character, are known and clearly seen by what has been made. Romans 1 and 20. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalms 19, Romans 10 and 18. Uh, it is customary to to distinguish between natural revelation, all that God has made, and special revelation, which comes from the Bible. Um, I'll sum it up like this. What we see, God has said. We can look at the stars, the moon, the sun, uh, the earth, the planet, the animals. Um, we can look at all of the things God has created, and, and, and that is what you call natural revelation. It is by those things you understand man could not create. God did this. Something much bigger than us accomplished this. God did this. But there is what we call a special revelation. What we read, God has spoken. So we understand that the Bible was written by men that were inspired by God. They heard what God said and they wrote it down down. So what we read was spoken. So what we see was said, what we read was spoken, what we hear God is saying. God speaks to us in three areas, uh, in what we can see, in what we can read, and in what we can hear. So what God has said, uh, we, what we see, God has said, what we read, God has spoken, and what we hear, God is saying. So God is known by his acts. God is known in fellowship. So if you want to get to know the Lord, we have to learn how to fellowship with him. This is why that segment on worship was so important. So here it is, that God is known by faith beyond the mere cognitive sense in fellowship with his people is one of the most prominent things throughout the Bible. Moses leading his people in, in the Exodus and uh, was assured, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses replied, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. You find that in Exodus chapter 33 verses 13 through 14. The Bible abounds in invitations to seek and find fellowship with God. It is important for us to be able to know that for us to fully understand God, we've got to spend time with him. Uh, it's, it's like 
seeing somebody um, who uh, you would like to get to know, uh, there's some type of attraction or there's some type of interest, but if you never approach them, if you never have the opportunity to spend time with them, how will you get to know them? It's so important that we learn how to spend time with God. Uh, a lot of us are attracted to his attributes. We are interested in his principles. And so some of us uh, admire him from afar. Uh, what do you mean? Sometimes we'll, we'll go to church or we'll log on to a service, but we don't really make a commitment to get to know him beyond those moments. So getting to know God takes a conscious effort to spend time with him, with his word, uh, with prayer, conversation with him. Amen. So, God is king. This takes us back to our focus scripture, understanding uh, who God is. God is king. He is king. He is king. Uh, for God is king. This is what Psalms 47 and 7 says. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with what? understanding. Remember I said this whole thing is about getting understanding? Because our understanding about God affects our experience with him. Now here's the thing we've got to understand. Uh, the, song, the songwriter said, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. We come to know God more and more by the experiences we have with him. Uh, we'll never fully know the, the totality of God in this form um, but, but one day when uh, we are resurrected, when we are changed, when we, this mortal is, uh, becomes, in, it meets immortality, um, we'll be able to know God in his totality. So God is king. So what we have to do now is we have to get understanding. Every day, every encounter, every experience with God, we understand more of him. And the more we understand, the greater our experience is with him. God is king. God is king. Elohim. Uh, it's simply means, Elohim means God of the universe, everything. He is God of everything. There is another name in the book of Genesis uh, in which a lot of people use when they call him Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Now understand, Elohim gives us relationship uh, to uh, his creative um, essence, uh, that everything comes from him. Yahweh gives us connection to him as being the God of his people, Israel. Uh, Yahweh, that's what that name connects him to his people. Uh, Elohim connects him to his creation. Yahweh connects him to his people. So it's, 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 in, it's important we understand every encounter, every experience expands our understanding of who God is. So a king, he is a king. A king for a king to be a king, they must have a kingdom. Um, we are God's kingdom. Amen. His kingdom is on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. So let's look at it. God gave man the kingdom to govern. We see here in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, very familiar passage of scripture. It reads, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, according to our likeness. Uh, we're talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created male and female. God gave man his kingdom to govern. Uh, so everything God had created, when he spoke it into existence, he said, okay, man, I'm going to create you in my image. So as I am king, of the universe, I will give you my authority in what I have created for you to govern and to have dominion. Now, here's what happened. Man lost access to the kingdom because of sin. 
uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 23 through 24. And it reads, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed a cherub at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So man lost access to uh, the kingdom. And so, so what happened was God had to create, uh, he had already created a plan of redemption even before the foundations of the world. Jesus came and gave us access to what was lost. Romans 5 and 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, talking about the first Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, talking about Christ Jesus, one, one shall many be made righteous. So Jesus came and gave us access to the kingdom. This is a great segue which is going to lead us into part two, talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And so I uh, just want to reiterate why this teaching is so important because it leads us to um, commemorate, to celebrate uh, the birth of the New Testament church over 2,000 years ago as Pentecost is coming and we begin to understand God. You see that um, even even uh, when God uh, put Adam and Eve out of the garden, he put a cherub in front of him, put a messenger, a messenger angel who, who was a guardian angel there uh, to guard the way back. And then the Bible says there was a sword, a flaming sword that went back and forth. That fire, that fire represents God's presence. So when Pentecost came, the Bible says there was a rushing mighty wind. Now look at this, look at this. When God created man, the Bible says that he breathed into man and man became a living soul. The church became an entity when the Holy Spirit breathed. He came in with a rushing mighty wind. So God breathed the Holy Spirit into the church. That's what makes us alive. That's what makes us vibrant. Not our programs, not our clothes, not our songs, not our dances, not our, our, our little auxiliaries. What makes the church alive and vibrant is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Second, the Bible says they will, that it's cloven tongues as a fire set up on each of them. Fire always represents the presence of God. Anytime the fire of God falls, the fire comes to conform us into his image. It purifies us into his image. And so, so we see here why Pentecost is so important because the church apart from the fire is dead. So we need the fire of God. So so these teachings are going to lead us into a greater level of understanding of why we need the Holy Spirit active in our lives, why we need the fire of God uh, active in our lives. It's more than just going to church. It's more than just having a good sermon. It's about us having a relationship that transforms us to become beacons of light in a dark world so that somebody can see our good works, glorify our Father which is in heaven. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I pray that you will continue to follow this series uh, in the next couple of weeks as we begin to discuss Jesus, uh, who is Jesus, and then who is the Holy Spirit as we begin to finish this series on the Blessed Trinity. I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for your participation and thank you so much for your support as you are following us online. Thank you so much, CT. Thank you for all of our visitors and all of our listeners from all over uh, the United States, all over the globe. Thank you so much for your input. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on social media. Contact us on our church page, The Christ Temple Church, uh, the, the Christ Temple of Kingdom Church on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Uh, until next time, God bless you. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. We just thank you uh, that you are teaching us and giving us a greater understanding of who you are, Lord, so that we can have a greater encounter and experience with you. Now, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will grant us your peace and your joy. Father, in the name of Jesus, until we shall meet again, we give your name all honor, praise, and glory. Amen. God bless you. Take care.